The uh, title of our closing special invited talk is Energy. All right, I'm sorry, <laughs> I get it right. Uh, the, the title is Fusion, Energy for the Future. Uh, and our speaker, uh, Dr. Charles Skinner from the Princeton Plasma, uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory uh, is probably as well-placed as anyone to know if that tagline, Energy for the Future, will always apply to fusion. Uh, it's been the standard joke for a long time. Uh, Dr. Skinner uh, has not only worked on fusion energy for many years, uh, he has been uh, active in inventing a number of techniques uh, that have helped to improve just about all of the incarnations of fusion reactors from the original Takamak fusion test reactor to the National Spherical Taurus Experiment reactor that was developed at Princeton and now to the current iteration of fusion called ITER, the International effort to build a fusion reactor. So, Dr. Skinner. Okay. Is that what we're going to talk about there? Uh, thank you for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, I'm here to talk about the fusion and uh, as an energy source. Um, and in the slide, what you're looking at is an image of the edge of the sun, which of course is a fusion reactor. It's a plasma, and these loops are coronal loops that are being formed in the magnetic field above the sun. So, the, um, okay, so in my talk, I'll, I'll start by describing what is nuclear fusion, um, how it relates to fission, why it's, it's important to develop nuclear fusion as a potential solution to all of the issues we've been talking about, what we've been doing to date, and, and uh, what is the path to fusion electricity. So, so the plot on the left uh, kind of puts fission and fusion on the same, on the same uh, graph. This is the, ener this is the um, binding energy released in the nuclear uh, reaction. And fission, you're coming down from the, the right-hand side down to uh, iron, which is at the minimum here, uh, by splitting nuclei. And on the left-hand side, you're um, fusing nuclei together and coming down the right-hand side of this potential curve. The big difference between fission and fusion is that fusion needs really high temperatures, seriously high temperatures. This is the reaction rate of deuterium and tritium as a function of temperature. And you can see you need about 100 million degrees. Um, so that is a big difference. Uh, now, Let's look at the reaction in a little more detail. Um, you have a deuterium nucleus and a, and a tritium nucleus. These are forms of hydrogen with additional um, neutrons. If you bring them close enough together, they fuse and form helium and, and, and a neutron. Now, to bring them close enough together, you need a, a very high temperature, 100 million degrees, whoops, 100 million degrees, which is in uh, the units we use, it's 10 kilo electron volts. The uh, product here, the ash, if you like, of the fusion reaction is helium, which is pretty ideal. You could even use it to fill uh, balloons for your children. <laughs> um, it's very energetic, 3.4 3 MeV, and you can use that energy to heat the plasma, so you can heat, keep this reaction going. There's also a neutron that comes out at 14 MeV, and this you can use then uh, to uh, generate steam and produce energy in the same way as a fission reactor. Uh, the fuel uh, is deuterium, which you can obtain from water. So it's universally available to every nation. And tritium is, is actually a mildly radioactive gas, but you can breed it uh, by putting lithium in, uh, in a blanket and use the neutron then to react with lithium to, to produce tritium. So, um, as I said, this is a, you, need, you need a really high temperature to do this. Uh, so why, wh wh why should you do it? Why should you try? Well, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here. Uh, but as we know from the last IPCC report, uh, to keep the global warming below 2 degrees, we need to keep the total amount of carbon that we ever burn to less than a trillion tons of carbon. And we're past halfway to that point. Uh, and the fossil fuels, fossil uh, carbon remaining in the ground is actually four to seven times higher 
than what it would take to get us to this two degrees. Now, this kind of may sound obvious, but what kind of boggles my mind is that we're actually uh, subsidizing people to explore and find more sources of carbon. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we all paid our taxes. Well, the US government spends about $6 billion in subsidizing oil and gas exploration and development. And globally, it's $26 billion per year. And that's a small part then compared to company expenditures, which our pension funds may be invested in, which corresponds to $370 billion each year to find more deposits of carbon, which in the best case, we won't use. So it's, it's either a total waste of money or it's putting more nails in the, in, in the coffin of global warming. Anyway, we, we've got a, we've got a um, number of different options to, to try to uh, mitigate this. One is nuclear fission, which we heard about today. Nuclear fusion, which is our talk. The other, the other ones on the table are carbon capture and storage um, and renewables, but renewables need a large scale energy storage in order to provide energy when the sun's down and it's not blowing, the wind's not blowing. And really, I think we need all of these things. So I don't feel I'm in comp competition with, with uh, fission at all. We, this is a huge problem and everyone needs to work on it. Okay, so now what's special about fusion? Well, like fission, it's a base load power generation. There's no greenhouse gases. Um, the fuel is practically inexhaustible. Uh, it's, it's, it's in uh, water and available to all nations. And it's really difficult to do. And, and the advantage of that is that if anything happens, that, um, it terminates the fusion reaction immediately. So there's no chance of a meltdown. The, in, in a fission reactor, you have a core, reactor core with something like four years of fuel stored in, in, the, uh, in the reactor core. In fusion, you put in the fuel you need at the moment. It's a little bit like the engine in your car. You, know, you only put the fuel that you need in order to turn the cylinder at that, at that point. So there's very little fuel uh, there, no possibility of a meltdown. And there's a machine called ITER that's under construction in France that I'll show you more about later, but it has, been, uh, it has gone through an exhaustive accident analysis where the safety engineers imagine the worst possible event and, and uh, then the safety system doesn't, breaks down and something else happens and the wind is blowing directly to the nearest town. Um, and they concluded that there was no um, significant risk to the public. And in particular, unlike fission, you don't need a public evacuation plan since the dose of the site boundary in the, in the event of the worst credible accident is less than 10 millisieverts. So that's a good, a good, uh, good advantage. Um, second is the, there's no long-lived radioactive waste, so no transuranics, and, and the ashes I mentioned is helium. Now, the, the, there is a neutron produced in the DT reaction that will activate the surrounding material, um, but you can select low activation materials such as uh, ferritic steel or vanadium. And the bottom right plot is actually a, uh, a plot of the hazard um, of a light water reactor and a fusion reactor and actually a coal-fired power station which also they emit low levels of uranium and thorium as a function of time. And you can see the, the, fish, the fusion reactor over some tens of years actually goes below the coal-fired power plant. So that's very good. Uh, in the top right graph is a plot of the hazard from the volatile gases, both in fusion and fission. In, in fusion, it's tritium, which is uh, one of the fuel gases. In fission, it's iodine, 131, which was implicated in the fallout from Chernobyl. And you can see this, there's three orders of magnitude difference. Uh, lastly, the most scary aspect to me is proliferation. If you look in the front page of the paper at what's happening in Iran and North Korea and so on. Um, but since there's no fissile material in a fusion plant, you already have a big advantage there. Um, now you can say, well, what happens if you know, some foreign power uses the neutrons to create uh, fissile material? Well, these fusion facilities are large. You can't hide them down a mine shaft. And if you have inspectors prowling around, it's, if, you, if they see any fissile material at all, they know it's not good because th there shouldn't be any. 
So it's easy to detect. And if you have a breakout scenario where you lock out the detectors and close the borders, it still takes a couple of months to, to um, make significant amount of fissile material. And because this facility is large and depends on uh, power supplies and switch yards, it's possible to disable it without any risk of uh, contaminating, contamination. Okay, so to make this happen is one of the grand challenges of our era. Uh, here's our familiar fusion reactor, which is the sun. And in the center of the sun, uh, there's a temperature of about 10 million degrees. Uh, this is comparatively cool from a fusion point of view, and this is a good thing because the reaction is kind of barely ticking over. We want this sun to last another 4 billion years. You know, it's already lasted 4 billion years to, to, to produce life on Earth. We want it to keep going. A fusion reactor has to be about 10 times hotter than that, and the power density is also hotter, and it's surrounded by material that's down here on Earth. So it's, no question it's a big challenge. So now the fusion reaction rate is, of course, the uh, product of the density of the terium and tritium and the reaction cross-section, which is a function of temperature. And of course, it, it takes energy in order to create the plasma, and you want to have more energy coming out from that reaction than it took you to make the reaction in the first place. And the, kind of ca the uh, number you used to um, characterize the insulation factor is, is the energy confinement time. This is the energy, the plasma thermal energy divided by the, the input energy rate. And to put all these together, you can get ignition when the heating from the alpha particle, that helium nucleus that you saw on an earlier slide, balances the plasma losses. And that means this triple product of density, temperature, and confinement time becomes higher than this number. So, uh, okay, and now, so how do you confine these ions? Obviously, you can't let them. Uh, touch material walls to any extent. Um, and you rely on the Lorentz force. If you have ions in the magnetic field, uh, they are, are um, subject to a force that kind of twists them in these uh, gyrations around the field lines. So in this sense, now you've got, uh, you've confined them in two dimensions. Of course, they're still going to leak out along the field lines. So the, the trick is, is you take the magnetic field and you turn it into a torus like this. So the field lines are then continuous, and there aren't any ends for the particles to leak out. Now, since you've bent it around, the field isn't homogeneous anymore, so there's some other features that make the particles drift. But you can offset those by twisting the field lines as, as they go around the, the torus. It's the same kind of thing as when you're trying to put honey on a teaspoon, you know, and you can keep turning the spoon to keep the, stop the honey from dripping off. This is... Um, part of the features of a, of a tokamak. And a tokamak means that you have a current that's being induced to go around the plasma here to give you this additional field component. Um, this plasma is then heated by radio frequency waves and by um, very energetic neutral particles that, that enter the plasma and collide and, he and heat it. Okay, this is the inside of the largest tokamak in the world called JET, which is in England. What you're looking at is the toroidal chamber, and you see these um, uh, ribs here uh, called limiters. They are coated with carbon, which is um, one of the best materials for withstanding high heat loads. This kind of um, uh, feature on this side is an RF antenna. On the uh, left-hand side, you see two arms. This is a remote manipulator that can come in to do maintenance. Um, so it's a large, large machine. Uh, now, so how have we been doing? This is a plot of the uh, triple product that I mentioned earlier, the density, temperature, and the confinement time as a function of year. So you can see down in 68, let's say, it's down at this level and has been pretty much going up very steadily, tripling every 1.8 years. And this actually is, is a pretty fast rise. This actually is faster than the um, increase in computer speed. And it's about a factor of six short of what we need for uh, ignition. So we've been making substantial progress. Um, now, the, most recently in the, in the mid-90s, 
uh, generating significant fusion power by putting tritium and deuterium in, the, in a tokamak. And this is results from both TFTR, which is machine at Princeton, and JET, which is the one I showed you a couple slides back. This is now fusion power going up to 10 megawatts or to 16 um, in, in a pulse, and this is then a longer, longer pulse at JET. These are the people in the control room, including me, you see there, and this is Ed Sinikowski, who's now the director of the Office of Fusion Energy down in Washington. Okay, so all of that work led to the um, design and then the construction of ITER. ITER is, the, is a collaboration between seven nations. Uh, the European Union is taking the lion's share because it's being built in France but also China, India, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and the United States, which is basically representing half, about, about half of the world's population. This is the building site. This circular feature here is the base mat for the tokamak, and you can see the walls of the building going up. It's a large site. So this is a big enterprise. Uh, but completion is about 2023, and it's intended then to generate 500 megawatts of power, Recall on the last slide we were like 10 or 16 for 500 seconds with a fusion power gain of about 10. And the aim is to demonstrate the scientific and technical feasibility of fusion. So this is, this is being built as we speak. Uh, this is a picture of what's inside the Tokamak building. Uh, the plasma is this kind of um, purple uh, cloud in the middle and it's surrounded by uh, diagnostics by heating beams, by all kinds of plumbing, by magnetic fields, by cryostats. The mag magnetic field is superconducting, um, so it's really a, a large facility. And this is a bit like, well, where's Waldo? If you look carefully, you can see a person actually there, or even one up there. Okay, so while this is being constructed, um, what we're doing, oh, and before I get to that, this is a um, worldwide effort by uh, these colored nations are, are parties to ITER, and all these red dots are fusion facilities all over the world. So it, it is a worldwide effort. Okay, so what are we doing in the meantime while ITER is being constructed? Uh, well, as you noticed, it's a big facility, and we're looking for ways to make it, make fusion smaller, faster, and cheaper, you know, the usual mantra. Uh, this is what's called a spherical tokamak, at uh, PPPL, uh, which is smaller. It's not as powerful, but it, it, you can see because of the geometry here, it's a kind of much more skinny uh, column in the center. This has uh, some favorable properties so that the confinement time is much higher than it would be in a, in a conventional aspect ratio machine. And also the amount of magnetic field you use to confine the plasma is lower. These red lines here are the magnetic field coils, and they're kind of pretty skimpy from normal standards. Uh, this has been operating, and the similar one in England has been operating for the last 10 years, and at, uh, at Princeton, we're just coming out of an upgrade phase that will double the current and the heating power and extend the pulse length by, by the factor of five. So that should uh, start operating in the next, next few weeks. Um, another approach has been proposed from MIT because magnets are such an important uh, element in the fusion reactors, this one is taking advantage of the new high temperature superconductors. There's one called REBCO that generates a really high magnetic field. And because, the, uh, because of that, it can be much more compact. And you see now the man is much, more, much larger compared to the size of the overall machine. Um, so there are and work going on to improve the concept and, and improve um, uh, what will potentially be a reactor in the future. Now, let me see. Okay, so the remaining challenges, first of all, in, in confining the plasma and controlling the plasma. When you have a burning plasma, some of the heat is actually coming from the plasma itself. And your, um, so the external controls are diminished, but you still need to be able to maintain these really uh, uh, extreme conditions that you need in order to make the fusion reaction happen. 
You also need to do it for a long period of time, you know, like months. So both of those are, are, are serious challenges. Um, the magnetic field isn't a perfect insulator. Some of the plasma leaks out and affects the materials, and you need to manage that. And you need the materials then not to emit material back into the plasma, like impurities that would radiate. So there's a two-way street from the plasma affecting the materials, materials affecting the plasma that needs to be managed. Um, and there's some ideas on how to do that with, with different magnetic field geometries and even using liquid metals as a plasma-facing component. And then after uh, making the fusion reaction work for a long time, you need to manage the neutrons, which means you need to demonstrate that you can use the neutrons to breed tritium and to extract the power. You, the neutrons will damage the materials, and you need to develop materials that will handle that. And of course, in the end, you want to make this work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So reliability, availability, maintainability, and inspectability for such a complicated object is, is a big deal. OK, so the Europeans now uh, have a roadmap. And they, they kind of methodically are addressing all of these issues uh, in a series of steps. You can see the time scale along the bottom. Uh, a lot of it will happen with ITER. This is a machine in Japan that um, is also uh, being used to, to look at these uh, operating issues with uh, long pulses. There is then uh, projections for, to have a decision to build a demo in 2030. This will be after ITER has run deuterium and tritium and, and produced um, fusion power, which will take some time to build. And then a target for fusion electricity at about 2050. This, uh, okay, so let's keep going. Okay, so, th th so this, th th at this point, you just have one fusion reactor. Now, the world is um, growing in population, and people in the developing countries want electricity too. So the amount of uh, electricity that's needed by about 2012 is projected to be about 12 terawatts, which is about five times what, we, what the world generates now. Uh, and for fusion to be part of that, you need to start talking about terawatts and, and multiple gigawatts. So the path, the, you know, this is a hypothetical path. So if ITER then produces 500 megawatts in the 2030s, then you have three demo machines, uh, which will produce 100 gigawatts, 100 megawatts electric. Um, probably not be available all the time in the 2040s. And then you ramp up. You have more uh, and more, more machines with more power as time goes on. Uh, finally, now, if you look at the big picture for the, over the rest of the century, this is a, a projection of the world um, energy demand. This is, and this is a log scale here, so you're going um, from over many orders of magnitude. And, and typically, any new power source, you start with an exponential growth phase, um, and then you get to a linear phase as you just crank out more units. So this is now, this, this dotted line is a um, model by uh, Professor Cardozo and two co-authors, um, where you see the model and you see the solid lines of the, um, what's actually happening in fission and now wind and solar. And fusion would then come into play in the second half of the century. Uh, if all goes well, and then shoulder maybe a third of the electric burden uh, at about 2100. So it's a combination, it would be part of the picture, including uh, renewables and, and uh, fission. Okay, so to summarize, now the need, as we all know, for low or no carbon energy is more urgent than ever. And magnetic fusion offers the potential of, of relatively clean safe and abundant energy. It's very technically challenging, basically coming because you're trying to collide two charged particles together. And you need to overcome the Coulomb force in order to get the, the strong nuclear force to make them fuse. But we've made a lot of progress, and we, we're confident that we can make this work in a large-scale energy use. And on the way, actually, there's an enormous amount of science uh, about how to control and, and, and what's going on in these plasmas that we learn. So the um, remaining, the difficulty of the, the remaining challenges will determine 
uh, the economics of how much, how attractive this is compared to the alternatives. Um, but we need substantial funding. You know, actually, if I go back a step, this is a, um, a scale of dollars. Right? If you're talking 12 terawatts of electric power, and reactors typically cost several dollars a watt, that's you know, tens of uh, trillions of dollars. So it's a, you know, the world, energy is the world's biggest market, and you need money to, to uh, do something significant in it. Uh, so anyway, you need strong funding, and you need strong will in order to make this happen. You need the will to persevere in the face of temporary setbacks. And I think the prospects for making it happen depend on, on whether society thinks it really needs this and whether it's um, going to be able to finance it and come up with the money to do it. And, and we talked earlier about uh, carbon taxes or carbon fees. And it also depends on the progress in constraints in, in the other alternatives, which if you avoid carbon, uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration and uh, storage for renewables, both of which face serious technical challenges too. So with that, I will close and then leave you a reading list. This is a nice introduction to how fusion power can save the planet by one of the, the um, um, key people in the field. Uh, this is about nuclear proliferation, which is a, a topic that uh, kind of bothers me with, with fission, actually. Uh, this is about the last plot, um, why we have solar cells but not yet nuclear fusion. This is a kind of cautionary tale, how societies choose to, it's a good book. Um, and then, you know, related to the issue of, of leaving the carbon deposits we know about already in the ground. Okay, at that point I'll stop and open for questions. Charles, thanks very much. Questions for Charles? Thanks for the enlightening talk. I was just wondering if you uh, care to compare um, <coughs> the tokamak with the laser fusion? Mm. Um, I, I have a number of backup slides, so let's look at the uh, laser. Oh, too far. There's, there, there is an artist's impression of the uh, target at the National Ignition Facility, which is a facility in uh, California. And this is an alternative way to make fusion. Instead of having magnetic fields to confine the plasma, you basically have what you might think of as a very tiny hydrogen bomb. It, it, it kind of holds together for long enough to make enough fusion reactions, you hope. Now, in their case, the facility is called the National Ignition Facility, uh, which sounds like they thought they had it in the bag, uh, but ha it has not so far ignited. <laughs> so I think once it ignites, um, then there'll be you know, discussion about how it compares. Uh, certainly, the laser that they're using uh, is not suitable for a power plant. They, they also have to develop high repetition, high energy lasers. So it's an alternative way. I think it, the jury's still out on whether it's going to be a good power plant. Yes. W w would it be possible to do something with fusion in a timely enough manner to be useful for fighting global warming? Mm. Um, you know, th back in the 90s, the, in parallel with the TFTR results and the JET results, there were a number of uh, proposals to make reactors um, similar to ITER. But there was a lot of political indecision at the time, because you know, they cost money. And, perception, and the perception was the US has lots of you know, fossil fuels, so why do we need it? Um, I, I see fusion um, kind of complementing fission, because in fission, the amount of uh, uranium as a fuel that we know about is going to run out in the second half of the century. Uh, so then you have a choice of either going to breeding reactors or using fusion. So I see it as, as coming in in the second half of the century uh, after you run out to uranium for the light water reactor. Yeah. Question here. Uh, I was a graduate student in Princeton in the early 80s when uh, they were talking about uh, being on the verge of break-even point. 
And now, 30 some years later, we're still on the verge of something. And the closest thing that you talked about is something that may materialize in the middle of the 2020s, ITER, and et cetera, et cetera. So the point is that we have a, a finite amount of money to try to solve the problem of global warming. And uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure that uh, there are no showstoppers, even once ITER is realized in terms of confinement and so forth. So I can't understand why we should be bothering with fusion. <laughs> OK, well, in the 80s, well, the 70s, let's say, in Princeton, uh, there was a, a PLT, Princeton Large Taurus was operating. And that was the first machine that achieved uh, high enough temperatures to be seriously, uh, like several keV, the first machine that, that produced fusion-relevant temperatures. The FTR uh, was being built and uh, was constructed in, and came online in the 80s and had some initial difficulties, but they were overcome and then produced 10 megawatts of fusion power in the mid-90s. So I think that's a significant achievement. JET did the same thing with 16 megawatts. Um, you know, the, I think if you look at it from a uh, broader perspective, there's no question that we need low and no carbon source of energy. And the three ways I can see to do it, none of them are certain. For carbon capture and storage, it's kind of like a reverse mining thing. You're putting it back in the ground. Well, you're going to run out of spaces to put it without causing earthquakes. Like, you know, at the moment, there's reports of earthquakes in Oklahoma because they're putting the water from the fracking back in the ground. So that, there's a limit to what you can do there. Uh, for renewables are fine, you know, but you need energy when the lights, when the sun's down and there's no wind. Uh, and there's significant technical uncertainties in, in the kind of energy storage that you'd need for just renewables by themselves to take over. So to me, it's a big problem, maybe the biggest facing humanity in this century. And there's no, no guaranteed solutions. So we need to, do, to pursue all the avenues that we have available to try to solve it. And by the way, I think there has been a lot of progress in fusion, as I showed you with that plot. Um, so I think fusion, the biggest uh, factor um, slowing fusion down is the lack of funding. In fact, I have a, a plot for that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, here. So this was produced in 1976, which was contemporaneous with the oil crisis. And, and, and that's when the fusion budget went up. This is, the, this is this black line here. And this was the projection of what it would take to make fusion energy. Um, and this is, this is the maximum effort. This is accelerated, aggressive, moderate. And this is the constant. So the actual funding has been far less than what people knew that they would need in order to get uh, fusion energy working in a, in a, in a, in a rapid what's time. The, what's the axis? Is that billions of dollars there or something? I yeah, this is the budget in billions of dollars, yes. $2,012. Dollars. Worldwide, is it the in the US budget? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, the, the US was world leader in fusion. It, it started the ITER project, Reagan and Gorbachev as part of the summit meeting. Um, I'd say in, in the 90s, in spite of the results from TFDR, it's kind of been a little indecisive. And, and now there's more money being spent in Japan and Europe on, on uh, fusion than the US. Quick question from me, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. So I think about a year ago, Lockheed Martin made a, a splashy announcement about kind of fusion in a bottle or really fusion yeah, in a yeah. truck. So I just wanted to I, ask if that's credible, that. or I mean, yeah. what's, the, what's the feeling on that? On the, okay. In the OK, good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, so this is, this is what uh, was reported in Aviation Week by Tom McGuire, who's the lead physicist for this machine. And he said, you know, obviously they want to make it smaller, cheaper, faster. Same thing. It's all good. Ten times smaller is the key, but on the physics side, it has to work. And then project is in its earliest stages, many key challenges. Now, you feed that into the Lockheed publicity machine, and... <laughs> Says Lockheed, they said they could design and build and test the first reactor in less than a year. Okay, this was in October, so they've got like five months left. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave you to judge this for yourself. Yeah. Charles, thanks very much.
Okay, been a long and fascinating day. Just conclude with a few notes of thanks. Um, just like to thank the speakers and the panelists uh, one last time for a terrific, terrific, entertaining day. I always like to thank the audience for hanging in there for a long day. So it was terrific. Uh, here, I thought it was fascinating questions and a really uh, energetic session all the way through. Uh, and then last, um, I would like to thank uh, Jared one more time, and then a person who was operating in the backgrounds. Uh, most of you saw her when you registered at the lunchtime, uh, Sherry Gargano, uh, who is not here anymore. She left to go home for the weekend. Uh, but Sherry is our senior administrative assistant at YCEI, and I can assure you this event would not have come off in quite the way it did uh, without Sherry's uh, wonderful work in the background. So Sherry, wherever you are, thanks very much. And then since this, this was Jared's conception and his execution all the way through, I will give him the last word. So, Jared. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, just super brief, um, some good news. We have a reception afterwards. Uh, it will be in the Yale Law School dining hall, just down the hall um, and to the left. Um, that'll start at 5 o'clock. So I think we have a few minutes between now and then. Uh, but again, thank you all for coming. I thought it was a terrific conversation we had throughout the day. A lot of important issues discussed. Uh, and I hope you all come away from this with a lot to think about. Um, so thanks. Um, and then also... Yeah. If and you haven't already picked up one of our newsletters, Yale Climate and Energy Institute, there are some here, and some spare agendas on your way out. So thanks again. And on top of that, an extraordinary thank you to Mike Orstaglio, um, who has been terrific in putting this event on, and in all things YCEI.